Liberals were initially resisted by British uh, Home Secretaries, and there were a number throughout the period. But the public and political calls to deal with these so-called enemies within our midst uh, became too strong over the course of the war. In 1918, a new bill was presented to Parliament by the Home Secretary, George Cave, aiming to introduce wider powers for the revoking of certificates of naturalization. Now, these wider powers were justified in impeccably liberal ter terms through the idea of a citizenship contract. As Cave stated, unlike native-born citizens, a man who is naturalized here really gives a statement of good character, a promise to be of good behavior, a promise of loyalty. If these promises are uh, broken, it is only fair that the state should have the right to uh, revoke a privilege given to him. Now, out of this febrile political environment, a series of amendments to the 1914 Act emerged, and this um, and these amendments enumerated a range of new and wide-ranging powers, grounds for um, denaturalization, including the effective transfer of loyalty. For example, if you lived in a foreign country for seven years without returning to the UK, you could lose your citizenship. Good character, if you uh, were shown not to have been of good character at the time that you um, applied for um, citizenship or uh, were sentenced to a period of one year's jail within five years of um, attaining citizenship. Disloyalty to, um, to the sovereign including tra um, included trading with the enemy or being um, a subject even of a country at war with um, his majesty. And a clause involving uh, disaffection or disloyalty to His Majesty, which we saw in the 1948 Act, remained there. Now, as well as being satisfied that one of these grounds had been met, the Home Secretary also had to believe in um, all of these cases, except this disaffection and disloyalty one, that an um, individual's holding citizenship was not conducive to the public good. So I think it was probably the 1918 Act, which was the first use of that concept. The Act required that all naturalization decisions of individuals from enemy countries that had been made since the beginning of World War I were uh, reviewed by a committee. Now, interestingly enough, despite, uh, despite the hostile environment in which this legislation was born, these new provisions didn't result in mass deprivations. Um, the legislation allowed for deprivations as a result of both the sole decision of the Home Secretary or by the Home Secretary after a recommendation by a new deprivations committee. And the committee's reconsideration of those naturalized since the beginning of the war under Section 3 of the Act led to 18 deprivations out of 148 that were um, uh, reviewed. Deprivations on, um, under Section 7 on grounds of disloyalty, bad character, and uh, lack of commitment, to use my terms, resulted in a greater proportion of denaturalizations, though the number of cases examined was even smaller. By 1921, out of 74 people referred to the committee, uh, 39 had had their certificate revoked. Now, as the 20s wore on, as the 1920s wore on, denaturalizations became rarer still. Between the beginning of 1926 and 1946, there were around 107 deprivations, with only 21 occurring between 1932 and 1941. Even the mortal danger that Britain found itself facing during, during World War II didn't lead to their rising use. When the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, announced in Parliament that deprivations had so far been infrequent, he made that statement in uh, 1942, he said that only one had um, arisen during the war. And for the next four years, 
uh, only three deprivation orders in total were made. Uh, now, the next set of changes to uh, denaturalization law stemmed not from war, but from the decline of empire. When Canada created its own distinct national citizenship in 1946, the UK was forced to reform its own nationality laws in order to maintain a uniform definition of subjecthood throughout the Commonwealth. And this led to the British Nationality Act of 1948, which, su which superseded the 1914 and the 1918 Acts, at least the denaturalization provision. <coughs> Importantly, the Act distinguished for the first time citizens of the UK and colonies from citizens of the independent colonies, such as Canada and um, Australia. The latter were not British citizens, but could become so through a process of registration by uh, right after living in the UK for uh, one year. Now, the creation of this new group of registered citizens led to a subtle expansion in those who could be subjected to denaturalization power. Under the new act, registered citizens could uh, lose their citizenship if they were found to have attained it through fraud or misrepresentation. In other respects, however, the Act made it more difficult for the government to take away citizenship. The provisions that allowed those who were not of good character at the time of their gaining a certificate or uh, who had remained a subject of a state at war with um, His Majesty were dropped. Um, now only provisions on disloyalty, trading with the enemy, criminality, commitment, and fraudulent acquisition remained. Now these changes generated uh, little parliamentary debate at the time, and this was partly probably because denaturalization was exceptional in practice. When the atomic scientist Carl Fuchs was uh, convicted of um, espionage in uh, 1950, a special deprivations committee had to be convened since no committee had, yet met, uh, had met at that point under the 1948 Act. There were other cases of spying for the communists that uh, resulted in the uh, revocation of citizenship during the 1950s, including the British citizens of Czech origin, Carl Strauss and Antonin Radov. Now, um, a number of other cases of uh, revocation of citizenship occurred between the early 50s and 1961. These involved individuals that were convicted, uh, convicted of fraud, espionage, international smuggling, and in one case of buggery with a minor. In 1961, yeah, characteristics here. Um, in uh, 1961, the Home Office Digestive Policy recorded that while 120 cases had been forwarded to the Home Office for uh, consideration, it had proceeded only in nine cases, referring seven of these to the Deprivations Committee. So the Home Secretary in this period could hardly be described as using these powers with any kind of abandon. The denaturalization of uh, Prague in 1973 for spying for Czechoslovakia seem to signal in many ways the power's last gasp. Um, and by the time a new British nationality bill was debated in 1981, deprivation power had not been used for eight years. Nonetheless, the government's deprivation powers were incorporated into the new bill. And defending their inclusion, the spokesman for the government, Lord uh, Mackay, outlined the uh, government's view. Citizenship is a privilege, he said, and we think it reasonable that there should be a power in the last resort to uh, deprive someone who has voluntarily sought our citizenship and then acts against the interests of this country or behaves in a way that brings discredit on the grant of citizenship to him. At the same time, the bill continued this process of, of curtailing who was subject to the, um, the grounds of subjection to the uh, power. The lack of commitment ground was expunged 
and the criminality provision was effectively limited to uh, dual nationals by the uh, requirement that it would not be used if it would lead to statelessness. <coughs> so there you have the, the direct appearance of statelessness in the law relating here. But this wasn't the whole story because the Act also expanded the reach of the grounds that uh, remained loyalty, criminality, trading with the um, tr uh, trading with the enemy beyond the naturalized to um, imply them all for the first time to registered citizen, citizens by registration, including Australians. Um, now, the parliamentary debate on the deprivation pre uh, provisions in 1981 was much more lively than uh, the debate in uh, 1948. Some parliamentarians question whether anyone should be denaturalized if it would result in statelessness. So we have that issue emerging there. The government's response was, it's the individual's own, own fault if they do things that get them in the situation where they lose their citizenship <laughs> and become stateless. Um, the extension of provisions to citizens, citizens by registration was also challenged by parliamentarians. Some of them argued that um, they, unlike naturalized citizens, were not contractual citizens and could not be accused of, or, um, of, therefore, of having taken up citizenship under false colours. The government responded to this by subtly departing from the metaphor of the contract. It argued that the relevant difference between the native-born and um, other citizens lay not in the requirements for uh, citizenship, but in the way that citizenship was um, attained. Citizens by naturalization and registration had both sought and been granted citizenship. Now, neither of these attempts to soften the legislation came to um, anything, though the issues that they raised, as, uh, as we'll see, moving beyond the idea of a contract, as the basis for justifying deprivation and the importance of um, avoiding statelessness remained important ones that were to come back. So by the end of the 20th century, deprivation power in the UK appeared to be moribund. By 2002, not a single individual had lost their citizenship other than through fraud provisions for 30 years. In 2002, however, profound changes were proposed by the Labour government. Now, these changes occurred under the shadow of two key events. Uh, first was the race riots in uh, Northern England in May 2001, which impressed upon the government the need, the, uh, the need for a much greater integration of citizens into a more clearly defined set of British values. And the other event, of course, was the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 which increased concern about the loyalty, in particular, of Britain's Muslim population. Now, these um, events fed into a significant tightening of the requirements of UK citizenship signals in an important government paper called Secure Borders and Safe Haven. In this paper, the government also made clear its intention for the first time to update its denaturalisation laws and to use them to um, illustrate the country's abhorrence at certain crimes. The key consequence of this white paper was the Nationality, Immigration and um, Asylum Bill of 2002. This bill proposed three major changes to uh, British deprivation law. First, the standard required for uh, deprivation was changed from the assorted clauses in the 19. Uh, 81 British Nationality Act on disloyalty, trading with the enemy, etc., to a single standard that the Secretary of State thinks that the um, and um, individuals holding citizenship is seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the United Kingdom. A second change was that denatural um, uh, deprivation provisions would now apply to all types of British citizens those who gain their citizenship through birth, registration, or uh, naturalization. Now, this important extension of the scope of the powers, of the subjects of the power, 
was uh, limited by a third change, and that was that the government committed itself to not depriving of people of citizenship if it would make them stateless, except under fraud provisions. The change thus extended the protection of the 1981 Act that had been granted to those deprived of their citizenship on the basis of criminality to all UK citizens. And finally, the, um, those subject to denaturalisation orders were given an um, automatic right of appeal. Though in cases of involving national security, which almost everyone does, uh, this was to be to the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. When presenting the bill to Parliament, um, the government argued that deprivation was an important and necessary state power, though one that would be used sparingly. Lord Filken for the government um, um, argued that this power was necessary to um, express public abhorrence at treasonable conduct and to show that such disloyalty is not compatible with being regarded as a member of the British family. The new provisions, he said, would deter and prevent future conduct and provide an um, additional sanction against treason and subversion even when an um, individual was not convicted of a crime. Connecting the new powers to the government's new conceptualization of citizenship, Filkin said, we believe that the bill is consistent with our approach to uh, citizenship, namely that it is an extremely important privilege. Now, the government's reasoning for the bill became a bit more evident in discussion in the committee stages of the bill. It justified parts of the bill by uh, referring to the new terrorist threats. The Home Office Minister at the time, Angela Eagle, claimed that the bill modernises the deprivation procedure in terms of national security threats and non-state um, uh, non threats. The old provisions, she said, were um, inadequate she, because they did not cover some of the potentially prejudicial activities worthy of deprivation, such as those to do with infrastructure, vital economic interest, or general safety of the population. Now, notably, and this is important to point out, I think, the extension of denationalization power to the native born was presented entirely as an anti-discrimination measure. The new provisions would, Lord Filken argued, for the first time put all citizens on an equal basis yeah. um, and recognise the principle that citizenship should be respected without discrimination as to the route it was received. The changes would put, up, put an end to, um, to a situation where uh, naturalised citizenship was, and I quote, a second class status. Now, the limitations of this argument were quickly noted in the Lords. The bill, argued Lord Goodhart, simply creates a new form of discrimination towards British citizens by birth who hold no other citizenship and British citizens by birth who happen to hold the nationality of the second country. The government also faced criticism on um, other grounds. Uh, echoing worries expressed as early as 1870, Lord Kingsland asked, why should a person not be prosecuted in the normal way, in our criminal courts, instead of deprived of citizenship? Other, con um, other concerns focused on the unique position of the native born. The Conservative MP, Humphrey Mallon, stated a person born in the UK, even someone who, um, who was not a citizen at birth, should not have their citizenship taken away from them. If I was such a person, and um, I committed a bad crime, I would expect to be prosecuted for it. Now, despite such parliamentary criticism of the government's proposal, the 2002 law should be seen as very much a mixed bag in terms of state powers. On the one hand, it certainly did extend uh, powers to a new and hitherto protected group, native-born citizens, uh, those with a dual nationality and effectively, one could argue, made them an um, inferior class of citizen. 
But the bill also allowed for um, automatic legal appeals, restricted the use of denaturalization power to um, individuals who could be made stateless, and linked the grounds uh, for uh, denaturalization to the weighty vital interest state test. So this odd combination of expansion and contraction is partly explained, I think, by the government's desire to stay on the right side of the European Convention on uh, Nationality. Indeed, in committee, Angela Eagle claimed that uh, this convention, uh, that, that it was signing this convention, that was one of the main reasons for the uh, bill. If it is enacted, she said, we will be able to sign the convention. So we are working to modernize our system. This is, and she said, a wholly non-sinister approach. Uh, in the end, parliamentary discussions made virtually no mark on the final legislation. But the Blair government was true to its word in using uh, the power sparingly. Only one deprivation order was made in the end, a failed one under the provisions of the Act. We've heard about that. Yet other developments were um, afoot at the same time, suggesting a somewhat less uh, restrained attitude. Two years after the passing of the Act, a clause was added to the Asylum Immigration Act of 2004, which um, allowed the government to uh, deprive citizenship before an appeal had been heard. Um, and Amanda Weston has um, uh, discussed this in the work. So, running a bit out of time, but I only have a little bit more to go. Um, now, another more radical legislative change to the UK's deprivation provisions was made less than four years later, again by the Blair government. And this was an um, amendment to the Immigration, Asylum and Nationality Bill introduced in um, October 2005, which loosened the standard required for uh, deprivation. The new standard, which uh, replaced this vital interest standard, required only that the Home Secretary show that an um, individual's holding citizenship was not conducive to uh, the public good. This was brought up in the context of uh, the Tubin bus bombings in uh, London in 2005. In a major press conference less than a month after the attacks, Tony Blair announced that the rules of the game are changing with regard to um, expulsion. If you come to our country from um, abroad, he stated, don't meddle in um, extremism or you are going to go back out again. In the same speech, uh, sorry, in the same speech, he um, announced the government would seek further powers to strip citizenship to make the current procedures more simple and more um, effective. Now, the amendment on the deprivation of law uh, emerged after some inter-party negotiations over the new anti-terrorism measures during the summer. In Parliament, um, the government defended the new non uh, non-conducive standard as necessary to fight the domestic terrorist threat. Um, and it was clear at the time, and this relates to the question of how one interprets it, which you discussed, um, Helena, um, that, um, that it wanted to make deprivation provisions, the government did, uh, compatible with a list of unacceptable behaviours which had been announced in, um, in relation to uh, non-citizens by Charles Clark in the aftermath of the, um, of the London bombings. And these uh, behaviours included glorifying terrorist violence and fostering hatred that might lead to inter-community violence. Now this easing of the standard was a radical step um, given the general direction of history since uh, 1918 uh, had been to make the power in uh, many ways much more constrained. Um, moreover, unlike in 2002, this kind of expansion was not softened by protections in another area. The government had clearly dropped any intention of signing on to the European Convention of Nationality, something that was addressed by Theresa May in her debate um, last a couple of weeks ago. Now, the horror of the London attacks muted criticism of the government's proposal and the significance of the change went almost completely uh, on, uh, uncommented upon in Parliament. 
One exception was uh, Lord Delacia, who said <coughs> the new provision amounts to an equation of deprivation of citizenship with the deportation of um, aliens. The Act received royal assent on March the 30th, 2006. Um, now, I'm going to finish my discussion here just after making a couple more points. Um, because what happened under the current government is not the past, but very much the uh, present, and what is no doubt going to be discussed today, and we've heard some of it already. But let me conclude with three observations drawn from the preceding uh, discussion. First, I think it's arguably the case that no government in uh, British history has had at its disposal more, uh, more wide-ranging grounds to uh, remove citizenship from um, undesirable citizens than the last two British governments. The not conducive to the public good standard was once moored to a set of undesirable actions by um, individuals, but since 2006 it has been set free, giving much greater latitude to the Home Secretary. In some ways I think that that legislation is far more significant even than the recent uh, past change. Um, so some types of UK citizens are now hardly more protected from um, expulsion than non-citizens. Second, who is subject to uh, who is subject to uh, deprivation power has also shifted dramatically over time, and not necessarily in ways that uh, reflect the impact of human rights. If you'll forgive my fatuousness. First they came for the naturalised citizen, then those by uh, registration, then those who were native born, and finally, last month, for the naturalised again. This chopping and changing has been almost entirely without principled rationale, and has served to create dubious and shifting hierarchies between different types of citizens. Finally, and this addresses something uh, this morning as well, one could, one could have argued, and I would have actually, as recently as uh, 2010, that deprivation was largely a symbolic power for the UK state. With the clear exception of those deprivations generated in the frantic atmosphere after World War I, the power has been used sparingly and in a way that demonstrated the impress of post-1945 growing concerns for uh, human rights. Since September 10, however, with around 30 people losing their uh, citizenship, the power can no longer be considered symbolic. This very transcendental power is stunningly consequential both for the individuals that are threatened and subject to its use and I think for the way that we conceptualise citizenship. The bill introduced in um, October 2005, which loosened the standard required for uh, deprivation. The new standard, which uh, replaced this vital interest standard, required only that the Home Secretary show that an um, individual's holding citizenship was not conducive to uh, the public good. This was brought up in the context of uh, the Tuban bus bombings in uh, London in 2005. In a major press conference less than a month after the attacks, Tony Blair announced that the rules of the game are changing with regard to um, expulsion. If you come to our country from um, abroad, he stated, don't meddle in um, extremism or you are going to go back out again. In the same speech, uh, sorry, in the same speech, he um, announced the government would seek further powers to strip citizenship to make the current procedures more simple and more um, effective. Now, the amendment on the deprivation of law uh, emerged after some inter-party negotiations over the new anti-terrorism measures during the summer. In Parliament, um, the government defended the new non. Uh, non-conducive standard as necessary to fight the domestic terrorist threat. Um, and it was clear at the time, and this relates to the question of how one interprets it, which you discussed, um, Helena, um, that um, 
that it wanted to make deprivation provisions, the government did, uh, compatible with a list of unacceptable behaviours which had been announced in, in, um, in relation to uh, non-citizens by Charles Clark in the aftermath of the, um, of the London bombings. And these uh, behaviours included glorifying terrorist violence and fostering hatred that might lead to intercommunity violence. Now, this easing of the standard was a radical step um, given the general direction of history since uh, 1918, uh, had been to make the power in uh, many ways much more constrained. Um, moreover, unlike in 2002, this kind of expansion was not softened by protections in another area. The government had clearly dropped any intention of signing on to the European Convention of Nationality, something that was addressed by Theresa May in her debate um, last a couple of weeks ago. Now, the horror of the London attacks muted criticism of the government's proposal and the significance of the change went almost completely uh, on, uh, uncommented upon in Parliament. One exception was uh, Lord Delacchia, who said the new provision amounts to an equation of deprivation of citizenship with the deportation of um, aliens. The Act received royal assent on March the 30th, 2006. Um, now, I'm going to finish my discussion here just after making a couple of more points. Um, because what happened under the current government is not the past but very much the uh, present and what is no doubt going to be discussed today and we've heard some of it already. But let me conclude with three observations drawn from the preceding uh, discussion. First, I think it's arguably the case that no government in uh, British history has had at its disposal more, uh, more wide-ranging grounds to uh, remove citizenship from um, undesirable citizens than the last two British governments. The not conducive to the public good standard was once moored to a set of undesirable actions by um, individuals, but since 2006 it has been set free, giving much greater latitude to the Home Secretary. In some ways I think that that legislation is far more significant even than the recent uh, past change. Um, so some types of UK citizens are now hardly more protected from um, expulsion than non-citizens. Second, who is subject to uh, who is subject to uh, deprivation power has also shifted dramatically over time, and not necessarily in ways that uh, reflect the impact of human rights. If you'll forgive my fatuousness. First they came for the naturalised citizen, then those by uh, registration, then those who were native born, and finally, last month, for the naturalised again. This chopping and changing has been almost entirely without principled rationale, and has served to create dubious and shifting hierarchies between different types of citizens. Finally, and this addresses something uh, this morning as well, one could, one could have argued, and I would have actually, as recently as uh, 2010, that deprivation was largely a symbolic power for the UK state. With the clear exception of those deprivations generated in the frantic atmosphere after World War I, the power has been used sparingly and in a way that demonstrated the impress of post-1945 growing concerns for uh, human rights. Since September 10, however, with around 30 people losing their uh, citizenship, the power can no longer be considered symbolic. This very transcendental power is stunningly consequential both for the individuals that are threatened and subject to its use and I think for the way that we conceptualise citizenship. First of all, thank you very much to Helena and Matt for the invitation to contribute to the discussion today. Um, this has been very interesting for me because I wrote something a few years ago about uh, changes to citizenship uh, policy under the Labour governments, but I haven't been following it. 
very closely since, and this was a, a good opportunity to sort of get up to date and go the whole. There's quite a lot of uh, getting up to date to do. Uh, so I spent uh, the last part of this week with, uh, reading through the parliamentary debates. And um, what I'd like to try and contribute today is, is provide some political context. Um, to some extent, Matt's already done that, particularly in uh, the, the historical political context. Uh, I think, uh, as a result of that, I'll be able to uh, treat some of uh, what I've got to say quite, quite briefly, um, because there's a certain amount of overlap, uh, which means I might be in the time. Uh, and then um, I'll move on and concentrate on some of the more recent developments, in particular what's been happening in the last few weeks, uh, uh, with the, uh, the current government's approach <coughs> to this issue. Um, I should say, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a political scientist uh, slash historian by background, so my contribution uh, today is, is, is not so much to uh, focus on the legal technicalities of what's going on as to situate uh, these developments in a wider political context. And, and I, would, I would say that um, whilst there are some uh, rationales which are in, might be thought as being internal to uh, the citizenship agenda, I think in particular what's been going on in the last couple of weeks cannot be understood without situating the developments in the wider politics of immigration. And in particular, the government's strategy in Parliament over the last few weeks is very nakedly political, as I'm trying to argue here. Um, I'd like to frame what I had to say by just introducing two uh, very well-known themes uh, that exist in the uh, wider literature on the politics of citizenship and immigration. Uh, both of these things are quite well known to people who are familiar with this literature, so uh, my intention not to introduce anything new here, but rather provide a, sort of, uh, a couple of lenses uh, to try and sort of think about, possibly even theorise, some of the <coughs> specific developments that have been going on in Britain. And for the better part of my talk, I won't refer to these explicitly, but I'll come back to them uh, uh, right at the end. The two things are, first of all, the debate that's existed in the literature since the 1990s about the importance of citizenship in liberal democracies. Uh, I think that Helena uh, referred uh, in her talk to the idea of post-nationalism. Uh, this was an idea that got a lot of uh, credence in the 1990s, uh, perhaps the most famous book here would be Yasmin Sizer's Evidence of Citizenship, in which she and other people argued uh, that the significance of national citizenship, the status of citizenship, uh, was being uh, diminished uh, and, and, and becoming less important for access to rights as the result of the emergence of a universal uh, human rights regime. Now, it's read that uh, an influential position in a debate is so rapidly and widely critiqued uh, that almost everyone who came out to say much about this in the following uh, uh, decade or so said it was totally wrong, uh, an exaggeration at best and just completely misguided at worst. Um, and I think now the consensus is clearly that uh, citizenship status uh, does matter, uh, uh, and matters arguably in many cases increasingly for a whole range of rights, including some more demanding rights than the ones we're focusing on today, because after all we're talking about some of the sort of most fundamental and basic rights today, the right of residence, but also for rights uh, about access uh, to social services, uh, uh, labour market, uh, and of course also political rights. So I want to sort of have that in the, in the background, this, this idea about the fact that citizenship is being revalued, or it's being reasserted as a status that's fundamental for access to rights. And the second thing uh, which I'd like to draw attention to is the idea, um, I think this phrase was coined by uh, Christian Locke in the version of Guir Abdon, the idea of self-limited sovereignty, which is the suggestion that uh, liberal democracies, uh, or uh, the essence of a liberal democracy, is such that it imposes on itself constraints upon its sovereignty. That it puts limits upon the kinds of decisions, the kind of executive actions, and the kinds of legislation that uh, it can make, even if those might be justifiable using majoritarian decision-making processes. And in political terms, this issue is in uh, a struggle which many of you uh, will be all too familiar with here, indeed from the uh, practical sort of uh, um, uh, practitioner side, uh, of an ongoing struggle then between uh, the executive, I think we read on a lot, have famously called them vindictive uh, state executives, trying to pursue often draconian policies towards uh, foreigners uh, and increasingly citizens, uh, uh, and courts uh, as institutional venues in which uh, pro-migrant actors try to constrain and limit the ability of uh, these executives to pass draconian legislation. Uh, and if you forget the shameless plug, the book I published just last year, uh, unfortunately I tried to get the flyer to hand down, but I didn't get it done in time. Um, it, it, this is sort of developed more theoretically in, in my book, uh, The Politics of Immigration, which I argue this actually reveals that a, a 
theoretical uh, level some uh, contradictions, contradictory imperatives in the liberal state, which I would argue are, are actually uh, impossible to reconcile. Okay, so as I say, those are two ideas that I want to frame what I have to say, and I'll come back to the explicit later. Let me now turn uh, uh, to, to the UK. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip through these next couple of slides quite briefly, because to a large extent, Matt has already covered them, uh, covered them uh, much better than I, than I could. Uh, the first thing to say is that in comparative terms, um, the UK citizenship regime is, is, is a liberal one. Uh, arguably become a little bit less liberal, uh, but uh, compared to many other European countries, certainly its approach to uh, access to citizenship through uh, use solely and now conditional use solely is liberal. Uh, and in particular, and it's important for our discussion today, uh, its approach to dual nationality has been uh, extremely liberal in the sense that the UK government has uh, never really um, uh, been concerned about dual nationality in the way that many other uh, liberal democracies across Europe have been. Um, and skipping forward then to, 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 to um, the, the Labour government, because as I'll show in the next slide, this is the immediate precursor in terms of the legislation uh, to what's been going on in the last couple of months. Um, but for the first thing to observe, I think, is that the, the Labour governments uh, had what I call a Janus face on immigration. On the one hand, uh, under Labour, we saw liberalisation of uh, the immigration regime, uh, particularly economic migration routes, and decision on uh, the EU enlargement. So there was no doubt that there was a sort of liberal, uh, liberalising aspect to, to what the Labour government was doing on these issues. But on the other hand, there were clearly more exclusionary, uh, <coughs> some might even say draconian measures uh, targeted towards unwanted immigrants, uh, most obviously asylum seekers and irregular migrants. And this is the wider context for the debate about immigration and immigration policy. And I think this tension could be seen to a large extent in the government's citizenship agenda. Um, on the one hand, uh, Matt's really referred to, to this, uh, that the, the, the government was concerned with trying to uh, resuscitate this idea, first put forward by T.H. Marshall in the 1950s, that citizenship uh, is a, a status and an identity which can have an integrated function. Marshall was primarily concerned with the idea of citizenship as integrating different social classes, I think in the context of cultural diversification of the UK in, in the 90s and 2000s, Citizenship was reinvented an integrative idea in the, more in the context of, of, of social and cultural ethnic diversity. But on the other hand, we saw a number of developments uh, in, in which uh, citizenship, and in particular access to citizenship, uh, became slightly more difficult. Now, one could debate the extent to which these two things are intentional and they are mutually self-reinforcing. But certainly in terms of policies on naturalisation, uh, the government introduced a number of measures, notably uh, tests, uh, naturalisation tests, both for language and, uh, and then for uh, country knowledge, which could be seen as having a more sort of, uh, uh, not necessarily exclusionary, but certainly sort of raising the bar for access to citizenship. Now, that's the, 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 the context in the debate about citizenship and immigration, into which uh, uh, the um, government's policy on, specifically on deprivation, uh, was inserted. Now, this was, uh, and, th and this I will skip, I don't think that's really done this week already, but uh, essentially, uh, as is well known, uh, in response to uh, the uh, terrorist attacks in uh, 2001, and then in response to the July 7th attacks in London, uh, the, the Labour government passed uh, a series of pieces of legislation, <coughs> which started off uh, uh, dealing uh, with um, uh, detention, but, but the, the the, the, the Act in 2001, the immediate response to, to September 11, was important because it, it was there that there was a discursive linkage uh, made quite explicitly between migration and counter-terrorism. Uh, this led on it, it, it eventually to the 2002 Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act, uh, in which, uh, as Matt has said, we find uh, sort of rationalisation of the number of uh, grounds for deprivation that had existed uh, prior to that into a, a single standard uh, uh, using this phrase, seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the UK, which is precisely the phrase uh, that the uh, current government is trying to reintroduce is trying to reintroduce into law, uh, and which <coughs> comes actually from the government's uh, exception to the 1961 Convention on Statelessness. Um, but the most important piece of legislation here uh, was the uh, legislative response to the 2005 attacks, in which um, initially. Uh, before um, going to the statute book, Charles Clark published famously this list of unacceptable behaviours, which were then to be issued to immigration and entry clearance officers 
to inform their decisions. This was incredibly controversial, uh, and, and, and it's significant because it later reappears in the, the legislation, which was uh, introduced in 2005, and then passed in 2006, which uh, um, um, reduced the threshold for deprivation of citizenship from uh, this, uh, uh, well, I put here 1981 uh, definition, but uh, I suppose more strictly 2002 definition, of uh, deprivation being, uh, um, uh, on the grounds of uh, it, it being uh, intra, uh, someone's uh, citizenship being seriously prejudicial to the interests of the UK, to this much lower threshold of deprivation on the grounds that is uh, conducive to the public good. Uh, and crucially, that conduciveness to the public good, if you look then at the immigration rules, included not just things like terrorism and fraud, but these unacceptable behaviours. So that uh, not only was the threshold lowered from seriously prejudicial to uh, conducive to the public good, but uh, a, a quite broad, uh, uh, potentially uh, loose ground uh, for um, uh, understanding what conducive means was introduced. Um, but of course, the key constraint that was put uh, on uh, uh, <coughs> on this uh, uh, policy was that deprivation uh, must not leave a person's status. Okay, let me fast forward now to the present day uh, uh, and again start just with some context before honing in on the, the, the recent uh, parliamentary debate. Um, so, uh, as many of you will know, the Conservatives uh, campaigned in 2010 uh, on a commitment to uh, get tough on migration, uh, on regular migration to reduce uh, net migration uh, this famous phrase that David Cameron uh, coined uh, his commitment to reduce net migration from tens of thousands, sorry, from hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands. To put that in context, at, the, at that time, net migration was about 250,000. Uh, uh, so if that, if his phrase implies reducing it to below 100,000, that's a commitment to more than half net migration in the space of five years. Um, this is being put into effect by a, a range of policies on work-related migration, family and student groups, uh, and the government has indeed put down pressure on, on immigration, which is of course half the net migration equation. Uh, and although it's unlikely to reach its target, it's certainly reduced uh, net migration, and it seems pretty clear that its policies on, on this, particularly in the area of students uh, and on family migration, has had a significant, significant effect on numbers. Um, but it was in the uh, area of irregular or illegal migration, as the media and government prefer to call it, uh, uh, that um, we find the more immediate context for the discussion about the migration situation. Theresa May has famously said that she wishes to create a, quote, a hostile environment for uh, uh, illegal or irregular immigrants in the UK. And uh, there is some overlap between these two areas, whilst the, the, the new piece of legislation, the Immigration Bill, is, is, is principally about irregular migration. There's clearly overlap between irregular and regular insofar as a lot of the policies on family migration around so-called sham marriages and the policies on uh, student migration around so-called famous colleges uh, are also about uh, tackling the regular migration. We've also seen famously the, uh, uh, the introduction of vans uh, driving around parts of London uh, with uh, billboards on the side telling people to go home, uh, something which was you know, widely criticised even by uh, Nigel Farage in the UK last year, which says quite a lot. Um, and so there's been this wider sort of climate to try and, 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 and bear down, not just on the, 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 the legal entries, but on the irregularities. And this is what the Immigration Bill 2013 seeks to do. And it's into this bill that the government's uh, new proposals on deprivation of citizenship are being inserted. And they have been inserted precisely in such a way as to enable uh, the government to pursue several of its policies uh, and its wider agenda on irregular immigration in general. So if you're wondering, well, this doesn't seem that related to deprivation, well, because deprivation and the amendment that the government has introduced uh, has become uh, a sort of Trojan horse uh, to allow them to pursue a range of other policies. Let me explain. Um, so the, the immigration bill was presented to Parliament last October. It contains a whole range of measures. It reduces the rights of appeal. Uh, um, it reduces the idea that uh, appeals uh, um, against deportation should, uh, uh, in most cases, occur from abroad. It introduces the uh, idea of landlords uh, making, and banks making immigration checks, uh, which is why it was so embarrassing for Mark Clark, obviously, to be discovered to be employing himself. Uh, getting regular immigrants cleaner, uh, people you know exactly what he was doing, seems to uh, make it difficult to justify that so many other people could do 
precisely what the legislation would require, and uh, an introduction of a, of a levy uh, that this bring back to radio migration or, or, or for access to the NHS for, uh, for uh, uh, temporary migrants, particularly students. Now, in a historical coincidence, the, 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 just the day before the bill was introduced to Parliament, the government lost uh, the case of Al Jenner in the Supreme Court. Uh, no doubt the lawyers here will talk about this more later, even though they can get into more authority and more detail. But as I understand it, uh, essentially, uh, this was a case in which the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the Home Secretary could not deprive uh, uh, Mr. Al Jenner of his citizenship uh, because to do so would have rendered him stateless. Now, Mr. Al Jeda uh, had been an asylum seeker, uh, and he had been granted asylum in the uh, early 2000s, I believe, uh, under the previous governments. Uh, he'd then gone to Iraq uh, and had been allegedly uh, fighting against British forces in Iraq. British forces detained him without trial or charge for three years. He took the government to uh, uh, court and won at the European uh, Court of Human Rights, uh, won a, a compensation from the government. Uh, and, and, and then, uh, the, the then Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, uh, tried to deprive him of his citizenship, which set in train this series of court cases, which eventually issues in the Al Jenner ruling uh, in uh, 2013, for October last year. And, and, and this, in this case, the, the Home Secretary had argued that um, because uh, Mr. Al Jenner was uh, entitled to apply for Iraqi citizenship, he was not going to be rendered stateless by the Home Office's move to deprive him of his UK citizenship. He would be sort of voluntarily stateless, uh, because he would only remain stateless so long as he chose not to uh, apply for Iraqi uh, uh, citizenship. The Supreme Court threw this out and said this is not material. Uh, well, it's, not, it's not relevant whether or not the person has the opportunity to apply for another citizenship, which of course then would be conditional on, on being granted, or whether or not at the moment of deprivation that person actually has another citizenship. Okay. So, so these two things happened literally uh, one day after the other, but they weren't, I think, linked. But they become linked, uh, uh, well, they have, they have become linked in the last couple of weeks. Now, I think the government, as I understand it, and I haven't done any interviews on this, but uh, yeah, from what I read, immediately uh, uh, wanted to challenge and perhaps use legislation to, to enable it to, um, to uh, uh, deprive uh, Mr. Al Jeddah. Uh, and this started being discussed. But nothing happened for several months. Uh, and on uh, the 29th of January, uh, so just a couple of weeks ago, which was the day before the immigration bill was due to be debated in the House of Commons at the court and the third reading, the government introduced this raft of amendments, 50 amendments to, to the legislation. Um, many of them were, were technical and complex, uh, and they included this uh, uh, um, amendment called Clause 18 on the Declaration of Citizenship. And this is what, um, discussed before. This, this clause, uh, which is now passed through the Commons, it's going through the Lords, will empower the Home Secretary to deprive a naturalised citizen of their citizenship if, and again using or reintroducing the language of the UK's exception to the 1961 Convention, their conduct is seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the UK, even if this would render that person stateless. Now, why did the government decide to introduce these large number of amendments in particular? put in this controversial Clause 18 amendment 24 hours before a third reading debate. A highly unusual move. Well, actually not unusual, but I it. <laughs> um, well, the answer is that it was all about parliamentary tactics, or at least that part of the proposed to So what we're facing here is a fundamental change. Now, okay, let me qualify this. I, I don't, I mean, the, the driver of this policy is not simply this, the specificities of, it, of this uh, attempt to get this legislation through, but certainly the timing and the way in which it's been put through, the sense of how and why, has certainly been shaped by these very immediate political concerns. The government was facing two backbench rebellions, uh, both of which got quite a lot of coverage in the media. Uh, Nigel Mills, MP, uh, was going to, uh, proposing to introduce, or did introduce an amendment which would have reintroduced controls on Romanians and Bulgarians uh, coming to the UK. And Dominic Raab, another Conservative backbench MP, introduced Clause 15, uh, which was an amendment on deportation appeals uh, to effectively uh, reduce the scope for courts uh, um, to um, uh, sorry, re reduce the ability to use Article 8 of uh, the right to family life uh, to uh, uh, appeal against the deportation. Now, it was a, a very interesting debate if you don't read it because Theresa May gets praised left, right, and centre. She even praises herself. 
Jim um, <laughs> Embrazer, um, back bench conservative MP, called it extraordinarily generous in giving way so many times. <coughs> after she had been criticised by one other MP for speaking for more than an hour on Clause 18, uh, Theresa May described her approach as incredibly generous in taking it to make it. Now, uh, when as formidable uh, as uh, Home Secretary as Theresa May uh, is being praised for her generosity, one would be remiss to be suspicious. And clearly, what was going on here was that the government uh, introduced this raft of amendments, and in particular this amendment that it knew would be controversial and attract a significant amount of debate, in order to use up parliamentary time. I believe four and a half hours had been allocated to the debate on the bill, uh, and there was this threat uh, that both of these uh, backbench amendments uh, would uh, uh, be uh, debated and voted on with the government would lose. So I would propose that Clause 18 served uh, two tactical purposes uh, 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 a few weeks ago. Uh, first of all, it, uh, and, and here it was entirely successful, in the sense that the, uh, the order papers that day put Nigel Mill's amendment so far down the list uh, that the, it was not eventually debated at all, and not voted on. So the, uh, the amendment there was, 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 was completely absent from the parliamentary debate. Uh, from Dominic Raab's amendment on deportation appeals was debated and was voted on. Uh, but here the government, by uh, putting forward this policy at this point in time, sought to sort of burnish its credentials and being tough on immigration and try uh, and reassure those who were attempted to support uh, Raab's Clause 15 that the government was uh, uh, getting tough, even if not in exactly the same area, but generally speaking, in terms of uh, uh, its approach to immigration. So this was partly successful. The Clause 15 amendment, Dominic Raab's amendment, as I say, was voted on. It was defeated by 241 to 97. Uh, Labour and the Liberal Democrats voted against uh, 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 this amendment. The, the Conservatives, again, just got quite a lot of coverage, were told by Cameron to abstain. He was worried that if he told them to vote against, that would uh, provoke a, a larger amendment. Uh, clause 18, uh, which is obviously the focus of today, uh, passed comfortably uh, by 297 to 34. Uh, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats, of course, as partners in the coalition, voted for it. Uh, uh, Labour chose to abstain. That, come that way. So, so stepping back from the parliamentary tactics to the wider uh, party political uh, uh, context, which I think is necessary to understand why the various actors and various parties are taking the positions that they do. Uh, well, as we all know, the immigration debates become particularly febrile. Uh, um, as uh, uh, pollsters tell uh, the government and indeed the opposition, uh, immigration is not very popular. Uh, and we have, of course, the rise. Uh, for the first time in UK history, or at least recent UK history, of a serious far-right anti-immigrant party in the form of UK. Uh, the BNP never really that serious because of their uh, fascist and racist past, put people off, but we have now in the form of UK, um, a party that is a serious threat to the mainstream parties. And what I want to come and say, not just a threat to Conservatives, a threat in to the Liberal Democrats, because uh, if we ask, who has moved the most on these issues, and it's particularly in, in, on immigration in general, and then particularly on the deprivation issue, uh, it's the Liberal Democrats. Um, the range of positions on this has become extremely narrow, there's pretty much a consensus, and, 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 and uh, a view on deprivation of citizenship. The, the, the proposal on deprivation of citizenship, uh, whilst it attracted criticism from the opposition, and did the opposition put forward some amendments, or proposed to put forward amendments in the House of Lords uh, on um, on judicial oversight of this, and nevertheless uh, accepted the, the, the broad, uh, its broad thrust. Uh, the Conservatives, uh, you know, and I'm thinking it's not in terms of, of, of the law or what's right or wrong, just purely in terms of electoral strategy, I uh, see this all as an opportunity to uh, burnish their credentials. It's a vote winner for them in, in, in terms of their competition with Labour, and it's, of course, a uh, potential vote loser if they're not seen as being sufficiently tough uh, with the rise of the UK. Labour, for their part, I think have become extremely wary of opposing the Conservatives on immigration in general and deprivation in particular for fear of being portrayed as soft. Uh, they're going around, as you'll know, apologising for what many people have done. Morris was saying it's a very good idea, which was the liberalisation of economic immigration, and now saying it's a terrible mistake. And so in this context, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to start defending or critiquing the government on a policy such as deprivation of citizenship, which invokes issues of, of national security. It's the Liberal Democrats who, in many ways, have moved the most on all of this. They have clearly sought to reposition themselves on immigration. Um, here I have been doing some research with a colleague of mine, interviewing uh, 
senior members of the party. And frankly, they've told us quite openly that the uh, very uh, progressive uh, platform that they campaigned on in 2010 was something that uh, senior members of the party were very happy to just say, because whilst uh, it was indeed liberal and spoke to their core, it, it was not popular, apparently, uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, on the doorstep. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's all. Awesome. So, uh, where are we right now before I come to my conclusion? So, the immigration bill passed through uh, the Commons, um, including Clause 18, which is now part of Clause 60, for reasons I don't understand, so you can tell me that. Um, and it's uh, just this Monday, uh, it was debated, uh, the second reading uh, was debated in the House of Lords, uh, uh, where it was it received wide criticism from uh, uh, a number of Lords, uh, uh, law Lords, or I suppose the Lords, the existing law Lords laws with uh, legal background, uh, and as I said, Labour uh, have promised to introduce an amendment for judicial oversight uh, when it goes to the committee stage, which will start in uh, a couple of weeks. So my conclusions, on uh, you know, stepping back from the details of what's been going on in the parliamentary tactics and so on, my conclusions about what this all means uh, uh, for those two issues that I flagged up earlier, uh, uh, sovereignty and citizenship. Um, well, well, uh, some of this again relates and perhaps even repeats things that Helena and Matt have said in their conclusions. Uh, access to uh, and exclusion from citizenship is, is, is right at the very heart of what uh, it is to be some decisions about who is and who is not a member of the political community and all the attendant rights uh, speaks directly to, to that issue. Uh, and at the UK executive, in comparative terms, is powerful and it is relatively unconstrained. One might say, and certainly conservative politicians regularly do say, that the introduction of the Human Rights Act uh, and, and judicial activism has uh, increased the degree of constraint, something that they want to uh, address. But despite these claims um, about excessive judicial power and interpretation of human rights, clearly in comparative European and comparative terms, broadly, uh, the UK's executive is relatively uh, unlimited. And what clauses uh, does uh, it is clearly significant increase the executive's discretionary power to exclude uh, and therefore remove uh, yet another of these uh, self-imposed limits uh, on, on executive power. And finally, what does this mean for citizenship? Um, well, uh, as uh, has been alluded to by Matt, it, 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 it creates or recreates a, a stratification of the citizen's most fundamental right, the right to have rights. We have now at least three distinct uh, classes of citizen uh, whose uh, right to be a citizen, uh, if that makes sense, uh, is differentiated. On the one hand, the most secure are those British born citizens who do not have another citizenship. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of that list there, we have dual citizens who, since uh, the mid 2000s, have uh, been subject to potential deprivation uh, if it's conducive to public good uh, because they have another citizenship to rely upon, unlike those British born citizens. What the, the new clause introduces is a, is a category uh, and, a, and a new sort of uh, degree of insecurity for those who naturalise into citizens uh, but do not enjoy uh, uh, another citizenship. I think I'll stop there just to um, very last thought uh, just to say that um, in, the, in the debate on Monday, uh, uh, several lords uh, observed that, that, that this, uh, and I know we're going to talk about the ethics of this perhaps. Will come up a bit later, but the law, uh, clause 60, raises numerous questions about statelessness, uh, questions which, uh, given the speed and the pretty nakedly political way in which this was introduced, can hardly have been given adequate consideration by our government. Uh, issues around, uh, it, it, well, there are a whole host of issues here, but just two that I'll allude to that were mentioned in that debate. Uh, first of all, how the government will deal with uh, the immigration status of anyone who's rendered stateless whilst in the UK. Now, mostly this act, uh, the, 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 the Home Secretary claims that this will be mostly used against those who are outside of the UK, and historically that's been true, but it does raise an interesting question about what kind of some of the statements uh, <coughs> in the UK. And also, in that case, uh, and even if they were overseas and their families were resident here, about their families' uh, rights of residence. And those are just two things which, of course, are uh, uh, added to in terms of the much broader issues about statelessness. So there's a denial of this round of tax rights. Okay, I didn't manage to.
I think maybe they'll be using the room from 12. So oh, okay, right, we, told we will need to leave here. We have to leave at 12, I'm afraid. Uh, but we can minutes. continue the discussion over lunch. Um, there's, there's no problem doing that. Um, so let's have a few questions from the floor and then we'll continue this over lunch. So my question is for Professor Gibney for his presentation. Uh, you made the very uh, interesting point about the move from a symbolic use of power uh, in the World War time and, and uh, thereafter to a very real use of the power. I was wondering how far you think this is connected to other anti-terror measures and uh, the post-war, for example, the indefinite detention measures that came into effect after the war. And uh, that was actually permitted at that time. Whereas the A case in 2001 didn't really allow that kind of measure for non-citizens and uh, created different categories of what the government could do. So therefore, necessitating these other measures, amongst them, uh, creating the use of deprivation, is there a link between the other measures and how they are permitted? Um, I think most definitely there is a use that is part of the kind of broader security framework. Um, one way in which I think it's connected that kind of relates to these is to the extent that the courts restrict the power to detain people indefinitely in the UK and have. Um, and um, one of the things that that does um, is, amongst other things, is it leads to the need, at least the perceived need, uh, by the government for these people to be constantly surveilled by the state. Now, I didn't realize this was a kind of rationale, but one of the people that I spoke to about this legislation, and it was fairly kind of uh, open, was Charles Clark recently, uh, the Home Secretary when the 2006 um, legislation came in. Um, and he, he led its way. And he felt that really even just the cost of surveilling people who are considered terrorist threats is now so high financially as much as anything else and in terms of the diversion of resources that that was probably one of the cons he didn't remember much about the actual deprivation of citizenship provisions but um but he felt that that would have been an important consideration in the case of using deprivation of citizenship so what you have then, I think, is that this is one way of dealing with people who it would be expensive, time consuming, they're also you know, considered dangerous to have on British territory and take them out of the realm of British responsibility. The other side of that is, I mean, what is the le I mean, one of the lessons I think felt strongly by the British government from all of these uh, you know, cases from Abu Hamza to um, Al Qatada um, is how expensive and long-going proceedings are actually to kind of um, convict or to deport people from the country under normal uh, legislative, uh, oh, sorry, um, 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 under you know under established provisions. So deprivation of citizenship, particularly when people are out of the country, offers a way around those kinds of. Personally, I think that this legislation is really, I mean, to the extent that it's used, it's used on people outside the country. I doubt whether you're going to see any cases at all of people deprived of their citizenship. So I think it is all of them. You know, it's one element in the kind of overall security of the Because of the lack of time, I'm going to just take um, Alison and then Melanie, and maybe they can make their point together. Um, um, mine was just a couple of observations, particularly on the historical stuff. Certainly in 2002, the change to seriously prejudicial was seen by those debating it as a, a lowering of the bar on deprivation. And that was the move. Whether that was accurate is a different question. Similarly, with the earned citizenship, which was part of the package in 2006, the package before we got the additional terrorist measure, um, after the 7th of July bombings. That started off as conceived of as protective. It will make us safer if everyone's British. 
very bizarre idea given that you were forcing them to be British, but it was the idea. And later it was defended on an exclusionary basis. We'll be able to keep the out. Um, two final points. One, in terms of the number of questions raised by the Declaration Commission, the Joint Committee on Human Rights have just sent 19 such questions. In incredibly impressive set of questions to the government. So there really is a, um, a good case there. Um, I'm not prepared to make it available to press or websites, but I'm very happy to make them available to people who are not using them in that way. Uh, I do have a problem with the letter. Um, and, and finally, I think this idea of dual nationality is huge it, in, in the whole narrative. States that have always had a ban on dual nationality and the expected election of 21 and so on have, have had a very different attitude. And the UK's relaxed attitude about dual nationality is a big part of the story. And it's coming to the foreground of things such as economic citizenship in Malta. So dual nationality is a common problem in a way it wasn't. And it's something to keep in mind. <coughs> I'll finally write quick. Um, thanks, I found that really interesting. I was just wondering when we think about the implications of how we conceptualise citizenship, whether it's worth um, talking about gender difference. Because I don't know how many, um, I don't know the, the gender of people that have been deprived of citizenship over the years, but I guess there are very few women. And so I, I just wonder what that raises about how we, certainly how we conceptualise threats, but also how we conceptualise good citizens and good behaviour for citizens. And they're just linked to that. I wonder if there's any benefit in also looking at the involuntary loss of citizenship for women historically and they've married non-citizens. Because there seems to be ties around that about um, certainly voluntary loss of citizenship, but also excluding foreign men. Um, and I just wonder whether there's any benefit in doing that set of decisions. Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, just on the seriously prejudicial standard, that's, I mean, as I said, as well as the statelessness standard, that's the European Convention standard. And I think, and I'm not a lawyer, so I mean, I'll leave it to the lawyers, but I do, you know, how, how tight the burden or how tight a standard that is. There was some debate over the thinks that this satisfied that element of that debate, too, in terms of just what the Home Secretary. Um, has to have in his mind, and that was an adjustment too, because I think the original legislation was, had to be satisfied that these grounds were made. And it was changed the things that, thing. yeah, there, anyway, they, yeah, they, 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 they were love thinking in some respects. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but I mean, um, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's up for grabs. I mean, you could argue that it was pretty broad before, because even the the um, historically the the um, one of those grounds that the kind of disaffect, um, disaffection and disloyalty ground was not um, something, um, it related to um, acts and uh, speech. So that was quite broad too, and that was not constrained by the non-conducive standard. Um, on dual nationality, I think that's, when was that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, dual nationality is, yes, yes. I mean, dual nationality is a huge issue here, and I think the broader point from this is, I'm not sure there's a strategy against dual nationality as such. Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if there was. But I think what has happened here is that people historically have seen the kind of relaxation of citizenship to enable dual nationality as a kind of liberating of the citizen from the state. But what this shows is that it also liberates the state too because once you've got dual nationality all of a sudden you've got a place to send the person back to and this isn't just a kind of ethical construction you know rules against statelessness and um, the limitations on deprivation exist because it's bloody difficult to send someone back to so James. yeah i mean yeah that's really fascinating I, I, it's quite like your citizenship right? i like that like, dual nationality so I, think about it more. I mean that, you know, the old trend is what towards uh, granting your nationality and as far as the UK was sort of ahead of it most of the countries but yeah I don't I, I don't know I don't see that I don't see a conscious or intended strategy to 
very back on that, but I thought what you're saying is very interesting. Right. I think so, it's very odd that isn't one. There's a conservative back benchmark with those amendments about declaring your other passports when you apply for citizenship. And both his own party and the then Labour government showed no interest in that. I think that was 2009, and that's very surprising. Can I have a footnote on the dual nationality thing? In the 1970s, Enoch Powell thought that was a good way to get to the West Indies. And I think that's the point, that it is a power that people can use to exclude. Can I just draw a question that we can make to your We have to just do it over lunch, yes. Yeah. Because I'm interested in whether, like the father of, of, of Mohamed Sakhar, who made his entire family revoke his Egyptian national citizenship after his, his, his old son was drafted wrong. I wonder if there's now a trend in the dual citizenship community to actually... <coughs> yeah. Yes, that's, I, 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 Well, it creates an incentive to do that. Okay. I do apologize.